According to Word Sense Dictionary, the definition of the word deceptor is a deceiver or weaver of deceptions. Of course, there are many examples of this type of activity throughout history, culture, writings, and pretty much everywhere, such as with the serpent in the Garden of Eden in the Bible, which is the alleged story of where a serpent tricks Adam and Eve into eating the uh, fruit from the tree of uh, uh, knowledge of life and death or something like that. Uh, and is usually depicted as an apple. Of course, this could also be seen with the Treaty of Tordesillas, which is a historical example of offering that which is not someone's to give. A form of the deceiver speaking with the forked tongue, proverbially. According to Britannica, under the Google prompt, what is the papal and Treaty of Tordesillas all about? States, in theory, the Treaty of Tordesillas divided the New World into Spanish and Portuguese spheres of influence. <laughs> the New World, of course, in this context, is the globe from a particular century. The treaty amended papal bulls issued by Pope Alexander VI in 1493. These declarations had granted Spain an exclusive claim to the entirety of North and South America. Of course, the idea here is to present that which is not theirs to give and thus create conflict based off of a false claim or a unfounded claim or just simply a claim to territories. And we see evidence of continued efforts to reestablish and reinstitute control based off of these claims even today through uh, edicts of the United Nations and NATO and other sorts of uh, declarations. This, of course, is the very scenario from the Bible in which the devil, as so far as it's written, offered up that which was not his, which, again, just like the Treaty of Tordesillas in previous papal bulls, was the globe. It states in Matthew 4, 8 through 9, uh, this is the New King James Version, obviously edited, like all the rest. Again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. So it's basically the idea that uh, of the false promise, right? Promising things that cannot actually be delivered if you will simply submit. Now, look into a more modern example to understand these deceivers and the current visage they might take. We can look at, of course, this example, like so many, comes from the false pretense of being a truth speaker and a patriot. But we can tell from the title of this example that the writer for this particular piece of deception is anything but a patriot or truth speaker. Unraveling United States theories might as well add conspiracy to that, although they didn't. <clears throat> the truth about U.S. corporations and government entities. 17 Special Operation Group and Spartan Alt-Sobe. Soba? Alt-Soba? I don't know what that means. Uh, Patriot, August 17th. So this is a blog from Substack. And, of course, in that title you have the word unraveling, kind of like unraveling a ball of yarn, where it is in a cohesive and understandable state, and then it is unraveled to be uh, difficult to understand 
right, to be a, essentially you imagine an unraveled ball of yarn, it's sort of a mess and gets tangled up and things like that. And so that's the idea that is being presented here. And then just like they always love to not finish their sentences, this does not have conspiracy attached to theories, even though it is essentially using the same idea, labeling something a theory so that they can then degrade it. So that subtitle, of course, right there, the truth about U.S. corporations, government entities. U.S. corporations is separated from government entities. Most government entities today are corporations. And in my previous video, I established beyond any sort of doubt through hard evidence that what well, basically I just presented exactly what the founding documents of the U.S. corporate government is, right? Like it's uh, unquestionable evidence, essentially. And so what this is doing is that it's separating the two to, uh, like it says in the first part, unravel the theories. See, they're unraveling the theories, but they're not unraveling the truth. Instead, they're stating the truth about U.S. corporations, government entities. Yeah, well, I can guarantee whatever garbage is written in here is very far from the truth, or it will be a half-truth, or it will be focusing, hyper-focusing on one particular aspect to detract from otherwise. Either way, the entire thing is going to be a perfect example of deception. Of course, to look the part, this blog, the individual that made it, put up a three percenter logo because it's all about the look of being something rather than actually being it. Especially when you're talking about all of these rampant deceptors going around pretending to be one thing they're not. And I guarantee that whoever wrote this garbage, they would equally work with your woke ACAB professors and leaders of diversity and inclusion while alleging to, quote, back the blue. Introduction. Background on the theory regarding the U.S. as a corporation. Yes, so this is instead focusing on a theory regarding the U.S. as a corporation. And in that one line, you get more of the deceptive uh, viewpoint where they they look in one direction right they're gonna look at the theory they're not gonna look at the truth they're gonna look at the theory and which theory is that in the annals of American political discourse oh they just love that line few conspiracy theories and there we get it right from the the first line unraveling theories well they wanted to say was unraveling conspiracy theories because it states few conspiracy theories have proven as enduring and controversial as the notion that the United States is in fact a corporation. It's not a notion that it's a corporation. It is a corporation as listed in the documents of the U.S. Corporation Company, which states that one of its purposes is to not only control patents, but also facilitate the function of corporations, among other things. That's what a government does, right? Anyway, this theory, which has its roots in the late 19th century, posits that a series of legal acts and agreements transformed the U.S. from a sovereign nation into a corporate entity subject to different laws and governance structures. See, there you get a, a good idea of the way, exactly what I said, the misleading and deceptive practice of focusing on a fabricated theory made by one of the cronies that uh, work in this propagandistic corporate system in which this individual is writing for. Well, that's the idea of focusing on a theory that they made rather than focusing on the facts so that they, they can not lie while they're lying, of course. It's, it's sort of a, a line without lying type of deal. And so this is a fake theory that, or it is a uh, fabricated theory. I guess suppose it would, it, well, it is sort in, in a sense, it's a fake theory because there is no intent to prove it. It is simply a device through which they can navigate away from truth. A and in the theory that it's being referenced, there's a positive uh, or position of legal acts and agreements. 
which transformed, rather than focusing on parallel entities, one of which takes on the name of the, the uh, visage of the a U.S. government, right? It takes on the identity. It steals the identity of the U.S. government and is in, in, instead a corporation acting under the color of law. That's the fact. This is a theory right here. And it's different from the fact. And it is, in fact, doing the exact same thing that the U.S. corporation did, which is taking over governance in the name of that governance. This right here is stealing the identity of the truth of the U.S. corporation being a government and changing it to something else. So this is yet another example of that type of identity theft. Next, the Residence Act of 1790 was a pivotal piece of legislation that authorized President George Washington to select a site for the nation's capital along the Potomac River. It marked a significant compromise between northern and southern states and led to the creation of the District of Columbia. This act laid the foundation for a permanent national capital, symbolizing the unity and sovereignty of the newly independent nation. Now, there's a lot of garbage in that one paragraph, of course. But the main thing to focus on is the emplaced division between, quote, northern and southern states. That's something that would be in reference to, of course, the alleged civil war. And the alleged civil war took place in 18, or allegedly took uh, place around 1861 to 1864. That would not have been a significant thing to mark the division between northern and southern states in 1790. So there's some interesting elements that you find in this paragraph, among others. Of course, the obvious District of Columbia. A lot of people probably don't think about that word district. District does not mean city. However, it has come to mean the city of Washington, D.C., not a district. So there's an interesting uh, word game going on there. I don't quite know about all the implications there. And this is obviously focusing on a piece of fabricated history, which would be not only very hard to prove, but most of the documents that would relate to it would have been suppressed and hidden by the U.S. corporation because they don't want people figuring out that they are not a legitimate government, essentially. And that, of course, is the U.S. Corporation Company, which has eight people running the entire United States, as uh, referenced in my previous video. In continuation, however, the Act of 1871, which established a new government for the District of Columbia, has been misinterpreted by some as the act that turned the United States into a corporation. This confusion has given rise to a series of conspiracy theories that divert attention from the true nature of American governance. All right. So that last phrase right there is another one of your lies without line. Because a confusion indeed has given rise to a spirit series of conspiracy theories, which are made by people like this. They're the ones that make the conspiracy theories to, in fact, impose confusion because they want to as stated here, divert attention from the true nature of American governance. The true nature of American governance, obviously, is the U.S. Constitution, and the writer of this article knows that, and that's the reason why the words here are so twisty, because their intent is to cause confusion, to divert attention, and that's the reason why they make conspiracy theories. They make them. And then, as far as the part above, it states, has been misinterpreted. That is a classic example of vague wording where they don't state whom or who has uh, misinterpreted, right? Because they're the ones misinterpreting it on purpose. Uh, of course, another word for that is to misconstrue. It's when you take something and you intentionally uh, understand it as something which it's not. Like, uh, one of the most obvious is the 
part in the Constitution where it states that uh, the right to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed is so often misconstrued or misinterpreted to mean they can basically ban everything except, quote, hunting firearms or whatever. So there's a, a easy example there. And here we have that phrase act of 1871 right that's not the act of 1871 to which people usually refer it's the treaty of 1871 the act of 1871 of course would relate to the treaty but that most people talk about the treaty when it comes to this subject and it wasn't about establishing a new government it was about uh basically selling the country or the corporation to the British crown. Anyway, it's something like that. Now, they, of course, have to misinterpret and misconstrue the U.S. Constitution, as the so-called U.S. Supreme Court is very well known for doing. And so this alleged truth or patriot, three percenter person, states that the overview of the U.S. Constitution as the supreme law the United States Constitution, ratified in 1787, stands as supreme law of the land. Now, there's another note in there. Whenever anybody states that the U.S. Constitution was ratified in 1787, that is an attempt to diminish it. It makes no difference when the document was ratified. The only thing that matters is the fact that the U.S. Constitution is not only the supreme law of the land, but the document to which all enlisted personnel in the U.S. Armed Forces swear allegiance. Because the document was established through the conflict of arms. Essentially, you had two groups. One group disagreed with the other group, and so you have a fight. And the person who kills the opponent, the opposition, is the winner. And they're the ones that stand as the supreme law because they won, right? That's the only thing that matters. Anytime someone talks about the ratification of the Constitution, they're diminishing it on purpose. Because the only thing that matters is the oath and the force that was brought to solidify it. In continuation, is the bedrock upon which the entire legal and governmental structure of the nation rests. More uh, double speak or, or fork tongue deception there in that line. Unlike a corporation which can be owned, bought, or sold, the Constitution is a living document that belongs to the people. No, the Constitution is not a living document. The Constitution is the words in it constitute the supreme law based off the oath of the armed forces, right? If you ignore it, if you flout it, you are flouting the force that can be brought to enforce it, right? That's the term, enforce to put in force, to force, to make somebody, to obligate them through arms or threat of death to do what they're told or else, right? All of those things, those are the concepts behind it. And it doesn't belong to the people. It is, as is stated in the document, the supreme law of the land. So what it says is what you regardless of who you are or what entity you are, you have to do what it says or risk being destroyed by the defenders of it, as it states in the Constitution, judicial and executive officers that are bound by oath to it. And then as it states, it cannot be incorporated, nor can it be owned by any individual or entity. So one of the things that you'll notice here is that you have in this one paragraph contradiction you often find with these double speakers that they will contradict themselves because what they are they have a different idea of what they're saying and they're hiding their words so that it would bring on a different meaning to somebody else now if you know what they're saying and where they're coming from you do realize that it's not a contradiction because you understand what they're really saying. The reason why that's not a contradiction is because belong and own are not legal terms that are essentially 
this is definitely like an attorney that's writing this. And the attorney would know certain legal words as it comes to contract and corporate uh, laws or regulations of their entities that they're supposed to follow. And that concept comes out in this writing where belong doesn't mean own because the writer states it can't be owned by any individual or entity. It belongs to the people. Which people, right? Are we talking about the juridic people? And of course, we'll get into that later in this video. And individual or entity, right? Legal words that you would find in a uh, in the, the kangaroo corporate courts that we have today. Entity versus individual. And uh, that will become clear later on as well. Next, the Constitution establishes the framework for the federal government, delineating the powers and responsibilities of three branches, the executive, the legislative, and the judicial. It is a covenant between the people and their government, ensuring the protection of individual rights and the rule of law. So, more doublespeak here. See, when, re re when we read this and what the writer is really trying to convey, they're not technically speaking line, but in that last part right there, what they're trying to convey is that they're, that our government is an institution that comes on from high and levels ordinances, edicts, regulations, and decrees, right? That's the corporation. A corporation delineating individual rights to uh, subjects, basically, or property. And But what the truth is, is that it is indeed a covenant between the people and their government, but that government is, in fact, the governance of the wording, the lines of writing in the Constitution. Those are the governance, and that is backed up with the executive and judicial officers bound by oath to enforce it, U.S. Armed Forces, essentially, or at least those that have a uh, ignorantly been uh, in dereliction of duty and the, the people there is uh, as far as the current shifting of terms goes today is vague but at the time it was written that would likely have meant a natural person not a juridical person and ensuring the protection of individual individual rights and the rule of law well that's that's just it, more example of the same idea of, of the double speak the forked tongue uh, stating two different meanings at the same time and then of course yes it does establish a framework that's another way of saying it's like a template right you can copy and paste it what you have today are all of these juridic entities that are run by your service companies which all have these teams of uh, attorneys and, and licensed paper pushers and all they do is they copy and paste their templates that act under the color of law and pretend to be following the constitution only because they create they take and steal the image of it by putting pulling words from it and things like that but anybody can take the constitution itself and copy the parts of it ensuring that it carries on so that's the whole idea there is that they're using the framework of the constitution to circumnavigate it essentially to uh, obtain power in its name how the constitution guides federal and state laws that title right there that's basically stating the same thing they're using it to guide not they're not adhering to it Instead, they're using it as a way, as an example of how to get away with acting under the color of law. Quote, the Constitution not only outlines the structure of the federal government, but also guides the relationship between federal and state laws. Through the Supremacy Clause, Article 6, Clause 2, the Constitution asserts that federal law takes precedence over state law when the two conflict. That's not true. The Constitution in that clause, and, and here, the individual is 
misconstruing, misinterpreting a section that they are aware of, right? Previously, they've stated exactly what that clause is, which is the supreme law of the land. The Constitution is the supreme law of the land. And all of the things in the Constitution take precedent, but not federal law taking precedent over state law. That has nothing to do with it. It's simply stating that the articles, the things written in the Constitution, take precedent over everything. Doesn't matter what it is. So it doesn't have anything to do with asserting federal over state law. That is a uh, misconstruing of the words intentionally because they simply cannot state what the document actually says about the topic because that would render them fraudulent. That's the reason why they have to misconstrue it. Anyway, this hierarchical structure ensures a cohesive legal system where state laws must align with the principles and provisions set forth in the Constitution. More uh, example of the same uh, doublespeak that I just said before. States retain significant autonomy under the 10th Amendment, which reserves powers not delegated to the federal government, to the states, or the people. Notice in the first part of that paragraph, it states that only states retain significant autonomy, not the people. The people do not re retain significant autonomy under the 10th Amendment. That's sort of one of those ideas of not finishing the sentence. It's intentionally leaving out one element to hyper-focus on another and construe that as being the only one of significance. The people are always diminished. Either that or the people is usually referenced by these individuals as the juridic people and not the natural people. So that's, that's another idea of shifting the language by creating a separation or a fork, if you will. This delicate balance between federal and state authority is a hallmark of American governance. Notice in that sentence, as well, the people are removed. It is only in the eyes of this writer, the federal and state authority being dictating to the people. That whole section about the people and 10th Amendment is completely removed, essentially, through these war games. Uh, and could finally, uh, reflecting the nation's commitment to both unity and diversity. And there you go. There you get a guy who's allegedly three percenter, back the blue and all that, who is referencing unity and diversity. I'm sure his friends across the aisle, as they say, would agree. The relationship between the Constitution and corporate law. Corporate law, which governs the formation and operation of corporations, is primarily a matter of state law. While the Constitution does not directly address corporate law, it provides the overarching legal framework that shapes the way states regulate corporations. Now that is a lie, because indeed the Constitution does address corporate law. And in fact, in the next section, he talks about a part, not the part, but a part that addresses corporate law. So there you get another a contradiction as far as reading this in the way he's trying to pretend to communicate something when he's actually communicating something else. The Commerce Clause, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 3, grants Congress the power to regulate commerce among the states, allowing for federal oversight. No, that does not allow for, quote, federal oversight. It specifically states that Congress has to do it. No one else. See, that's essentially, it's not granting Congress something, it's giving a charge to Congress, meaning nobody else can do it. It's just like the Uniform Naturalization Clause. None of that stuff is done by any sort of Congress today. And no commerce is regulated today by any Congress in any sense of the term. They are all departments and other different entities that all are corporate and are demonstratedly corporate through all of their uh, gains, right? All of their uh, obvious uh, desire for profits, right? Fees and fines and uh, 
navigating regulations so that it benefits uh, all of their friends and, and perhaps even themselves. As far as the regulators go, they're often most of them are on boards. Uh, you know, I did the, uh, the video about uh, UN agents and local markets where I showed that you have mayors and in fact the Chamber of Commerce people are boards on a a corporation right obviously whatever regulations they're going to make are going to be made to benefit themselves for their own gain so there you go here it states of certain aspects of corporate activity however the constitution itself does not confer corporate status or ownership and the idea of the u.s as a corporation is incompatible with its fundamental principles well that's sort of true because the Constitution does not establish a corporation, but what we have currently acting under the color of law as the U.S. government is, in fact, a corporation. So, yes, it's true. The current corporation that we have running everything is incompatible with the U.S. Constitution. That's absolutely true. And therefore, the entire structure and all of those agents that promote it are, in fact, enemies of the US Constitution, considering the fact that they are incompatible with it, and therefore enemies of anybody who swears allegiance to that document, which of course will be evidenced in not only the articles of it, but the basic idea of personal gain. The US Constitution, the reason why it's designed the way it is, is because you have crown corporations that were acting at the time of its establishment through the force of arms and they were doing things and making regulations specifically with the desire to benefit themselves and to undercut others especially those they saw as their subjects commercially so the constitution the idea behind it is that you will have a government which has no personal gain most of these alleged government entities that we have today are obviously corporations because they all have personal gain they all have ways to make money now we get into his or hers i don't know who wrote this honestly faulty uh extrapolations of codes so we have 46 usc code 50501 entities deemed citizens of the united states and here we get the reference to the previous part where i stated that uh, it would be made clearer in the rest of this video. Anyway, defines the criteria for a corporation to be deemed a citizen of the United States, including incorporation under U.S. or state laws, ownership, and control by U.S. citizens. Now, that's a revolving door there, but notice here, this is a comment. This person who wrote this did not actually cite the title so that's interesting next we have the united states federal law and corporations federal corporate law interaction with corporations federal corporate law refers to the body of laws at the federal level that governs corporations activities particularly in areas that fall under federal jurisdiction such as interstate commerce securities regulation and taxation all of those things in the Constitution are specific charges to Congress. They're not things that anybody else can do. And they are obviously construing that to be, quote, federal jurisdiction in which anyone from the, quote, federal government, which is, of course, the U.S. corporation company, can do it. Essentially, that's because they only want to appear that's following the Constitution. So it's all about taking parts of the Constitution and using that to um, give themselves uh, all kinds of powers and things like that. One, Securities Regulation, the Securities Act of 1933 and the Securities Exchange Act of 1934 regulate the issuance and trading of securities. Securities and Exchange Commission, SEC, enforces these laws. Remember that word, enforce. Use of force it's french en force which means to force right with arms to make somebody do what you want you have two kids 
and one kid is bigger than the other kid, generally speaking, that kid is going to make the other kid do what he wants physically. Unless the other kid knows some other way to remove the advantage of physical stature, such as like martial arts or, or something else. But either way, there is a physical component to making somebody do something against their will. That is the idea of enforcing things. Now, the Constitution is supposed to be enforced through arms against the will of any opponents to the contrary. But it's not. Instead, we have all of these other laws, acts, and regulations, and ordinances that are being enforced with arms against the will of the Constitution. And that, in fact, is uh, waging war against the Constitution. I mean, you couldn't really construe that as anything else. Um, because the Constitution was established through the force of arms and it is being unmade through the force of arms as well, and of course fraud and trickery of which this individual is engaging. Antitrust laws. Federal antitrust laws such as the Sherman Act aim to promote competition and prevent monopolies. Now notice that it aims to promote competition and prevent monopoly. So that's interesting. Double speak there. Taxation. The Internal Revenue Code governs federal taxation of corporations, including income tax and other federal federal taxes. Notice that it states the Internal Revenue Code governs federal taxation of corporations, including income tax and other federal taxes. Doesn't state that it governs federal taxation of natural persons or individuals. So that's very odd. Bankruptcy. Federal bankruptcy laws provide the framework for corporations to reorganize or liquidate under Chapter 11 or Chapter 7 of the Bankruptcy Code. Federal and state law interaction. The relationship between federal and state laws is governed by the Supremacy Clause of the U.S. Constitution, which establishes that federal law is the supreme law of the land. All right. So here, this individual is, or possibly committee, it could have been written by more than one person, honestly, is they're taking a section out of the Constitution and misapplying it somewhere else. See, if they were going to quote that from the article, it would state that this Constitution and all, basically all legitimate treaties and other things that were made under this document shall constitute the supreme law of the land. It does not state that federal law is the supreme law of the land. It states that the Constitution and treaties lawfully made under it, they are the supreme law of the land. So there you get this diversion being done here. And it it's in stages, right? The writer originally recognizes that the U.S. Constitution is the supreme law of the land. Then they state that it grants jurisdiction to the federal. Now they're stating that it is the federal that is being recognized as the supreme law of the land, but it's not. It is only the document and treaties made under the document that are the supreme law of the land. It is not whatever willy-nilly federal entity decides to go around and enforce their own regulations and edicts, as they do now, under the name of that document and this clause right here. It's just more example of misconstruing things on purpose and intentionally, which you can tell because this writer recognized that that clause refers to the Constitution, not, quote, federal jurisdiction. Anyway, preemption. If a federal law conflicts with the state law, the federal law preempts or overrides the state law. Well, yeah, naturally, because they're corporate entities and the states are subsidiaries of the U.S. corporation company. That's how that works. Concurrent jurisdiction. In some areas, both federal and state governments have the authority to regula regulate, such as in environmental protection. Here, federal and state laws must work in harmony. Well, that's true because the whole idea there is that you have corporations that are protecting what they see as their property. That's what environmental protection is. It is protection of their environment. State corporate law. States primarily govern the formation, governance, and dissolution of corporations. 
federal laws apply in areas where the federal government has jurisdiction. So basically, the states can dissolve subsidiary corporations, form them, and govern them, because those are subsidiaries of the state corporation. Now, naturally, the states cannot dissolve the federal corporation, because the federal corporation dissolves the state corporation. So that is the hierarchical structure that you're seeing and is evidenced in the ways that you had crown corporations from Europe and they would have subsidiary or they would have what you might call a prince regent or king regent. That is somebody who acts in regent to the official. That's a subsidiary, basically. And hence, you have the, quote, boards of regents at universities. Now we have four examples. 21 U.S. Code 387 Tobacco Regulation. Here, the, quote, United States likely encompasses all areas under federal jurisdiction for regulating tobacco products, ensuring comprehensive enforcement. This is rather comical because the only thing quoted from that title is the term United States. Nothing else was actually quoted from that title, and there is absolutely no way that they base all of their uh, fraudulent authority off the word likely, because he states, or she, or them, state that it likely encompasses all areas. Well, there's pretty much nobody that would try to enforce the words likely. <laughs> Quite ridiculous. Next, we have Title 28, Section 3002, Federal Debt Collection. In this context, the, quote, United States, again, only quoting the word United States from the title, is defined as a federal corporation, a legal construct facilitating debt collection actions. Notice that. That is, in fact, a recognition that the quote, United States is a federal corporation. It's a corporation, right? And this writer is recognizing that because they have to, but in a very devious way. But the federal corporation stated in the title says of the United States as stated in the following. Title 28, section 3002, United States means a, a federal corporation. That first declaration is your fake truth, right? Your, your, they're forced to recognize something, but they do it in a way that they can lie about it and state, no, that's not what I'm saying. And then be an agency, department, commission, board, or other entity of the United States or an instrument of the United States. So, under this title, the term United States means those three things. And what this writer is attempting to misconstrue on purpose is that the subsequent two things are what the debt collection instrument is because it states of the United States. But this title also states that the United States is a corporation. So not only, so essentially, the of the United States is just talking about subsidiaries, a subsidiary corporation to a parent corporation. Now, Title 18, Crimes and Criminal Procedure, Chapter 1, General Provisions, 5, Criminal Law. This definition includes all places and waters under U.S. jurisdiction reflecting the extensive reach of criminal law. Now that's not quoting from the title, of course, and I know for a fact that that title is very long, so quoting from it would be a problematic lengthwise, but this individual is obfuscating that particular code or title as they're doing with everything else. Title 26, Internal Revenue Code, Chapter 79, Definitions, 7701A9, United States. In federal taxation, the United States includes only the states and the District of Columbia focusing on federal tax obligations. Notice again that word, District of Columbia, not a city. 
So that has likely a different meaning, kind of like you have the uh, homeland security regions, and then you have the districts of those regions. And perhaps possibly even District of Columbia could be a reference to the entire, quote, corporate territories of the U.S. corporation. That's what I would expect it actually means. And the obfuscation of referencing the city as, quote, Washington District of Columbia, the hyper focus on that is so that people think that the city, which is in fact the subsidiary district or the subsidiary entity of Washington under the District of Columbia. That's how that works. Because it's not just District of Columbia, it's Washington, D.C., Washington District of Columbia. Next, we get centralization versus state control. The acts aim to create a uniform currency and establish national banks, but they also undermine state banks. This conflict between centralization and state control continues to be a contentious issue. And, of course, what this is doing is it's the age-old focus on only two sides, both equally controlled by the same people, and completely ignore or ostracize any alternatives, right? Just like the misconstruing of the Tenth Amendment and giving it over to state autonomy, this centralization versus state control does not recognize the Constitution, nor does it recognize the people. It only recognizes a centralized control versus a state control. And those states are all subsidiaries of the central mechanism. So neither of those would be good options, just like the communism versus capitalism, where whoever has the most capital controls everything versus whoever um, adheres to social controls and a communal order where the community is all run by a centralized control. Well, it always equals the same thing. So in this context, centralization and state control are the same. States are centralized as well as all of these corporate structures, they're all hierarchically centralized. So there is no actual conflict going on. It is a facade of conflict. And the reason for that is so that they can obfuscate and ignore the other parties involved, which are, of course, the document of the Constitution, the U.S. Armed Forces, and the people in general. Now, to clarify some of this nonsense that was clearly written by a blockheaded attorney or attorneys, let's go ahead and look at some of those codes which are always going to be written in an aggravating and convoluted manner. So this is 21 U.S.C. United States Code 2021 edition, Title 21, Food and Drugs, Chapter 9, Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, Subchapter 2, Definitions. Uh, Section 321, definitions generally from the U.S. Government Publishing Office. 321 definitions generally. For the purpose of this chapter, not for any others, of course, the term state, except as used in the last sentence of Section 372A of this title, means any state or territory of the United States District of Columbia and Commonwealth of Puerto Rico. Now, you always know that they are up to something when they decide to leave references where you have to constantly go look up in different sections things just simply to follow along with the wording or with the uh, writing of that chapter. The term territory means any territory or possession of the United States, including District of Columbia and excluding Commonwealth of Puerto Rico and the Canal Zone. The term interstate commerce means commerce between any state or territory in any place outside thereof and commerce within the District of Columbia or with any other territory not organized with the legislative body. Now, of course, what they're doing is they are obfuscating the word commerce because of that section in the Constitution. These people have absolutely no constitutional authority, but they're acting under the color of law, so they have to pretend like they're following the Constitution, hence the defining of terms that you find in that document. The term department means Department of Health and Human Services. The term secretary means the Secretary of Health and Human Services. The term person includes individual, partnership, corporation, and association. The term food means articles used for food or drink for man or other animals, chewing gum, and three articles used for components of any 
such article. Now, notice uh, two things here. First of all, it states that there's health and human services, right? Uh, now, notice DHS is Department of Homeland Security, and DHHS is just an extra letter. And I don't believe that was an accident. Not only that, you notice that it states that person includes individual partnership, corporation, and association. But of course, that's uh, sort of not finishing the sentence because it includes other things as well. But what's interesting is that under F, it states that food or drink for man or other animals. So there it is clarifying that man is an animal. Kind of a weird perspective to write into these codes. It's basically creating a corporate law by which a, per, a man is put on equal footing as, say, a rat or, quote, other animal. And then, of course, the term drug means articles recognized in the official United States Blah, blah, blah. Pharmacopoeia. Official homeopathic pharmacopoeia of the United States or official national formulary or any supplement to any of them. And B, articles intended for use in a diagnosis, cure, mitigation, treatment, or prevention of disease in man or other animals. There we get it again. That man is one of the animals, just like livestock, right? And see, articles other than food intended to affect the structure of any function of the body of man or other animals. And D, articles intended for use as a component of any article specified in clause A, B, or C, a food or dietary supplement for which a claim subject to sections 343R1B and 343R3 of this title or sections 343R1B and 343R5D of this title is made in accordance with the requirements of section 343R of this title not a drug solely because the label or the labeling contains such a claim. Obviously, you have a lot of obfuscation going on here. That is a deceptive practice in which you constantly and continuously reference things so that it is tedious and annoying for people to read what you are writing because they are engaging in criminal activity here. And if you want to hide criminal activity, one of the best ways to do that is to make all of your work tedious and difficult to follow. A food, dietary ingredient, or dietary supplement for which a truthful and not misleading statement is made in accordance with sections 343R6 of this title is not a drug under Clause C solely because the label or the labeling contains such a statement. Now, this code right here is written like most corporate contracts today. These codes are contracts. They are signed between juridic entities and they enforced on the people who are seen as essentially, quote, other animals of those corporations, the livestock of the overarching hierarchical juridic entity government. The term counterfeit drug means a drug which or the container or labeling of which without authorization bears a trademark trade name or other identifying mark imprint or device or any likeness thereof of a drug manufacturer processor, packer, or distributor, other than the person or persons who in fact manufactured, processed, packed, or distributed such drug, which thereby falsely supports or is represented by the product of or to have been packed or distributed by such other drug manufacturer, processor, packer, or distributor. There you are talking about the mark of the beast. Think about that word, mark of the beast. It's like a brand you put on cattle, right? All of this stuff has to do with branding the other animals listed under this title, which are, of course, human beings. All of us human beings are branded under this title. The term device, except when used in paragraph N of the section in sections 331I, 343F, 352C, and 362C of this title means any instrument or an instrument, apparatus, implement, machine, contrivance, implant, in vitro reagent, or other similar or related article, including any component, part, or accessory, which is recognized by the official national formulary or the United States Pharmacopeia or any supplement to them, intended for use in the diagnosis of disease 
or other conditions in the cure, mitigation, treatment, or prevention of disease in man or other animals, or intended to affect the structure of any function of the body of man or other animals, and which does not achieve its primary intended purpose through chemical action within or on the body of man or other animals, and which is not dependent upon being metabolized for the achievement of its primary intended purpose. The term device does not include software functions excluded pursuant to section 360J O of this title. The term counterfeit device means a device which or the container packaging or labeling of which without authorization bears a trademark, trade name, or other identifying mark or imprint or any likeness thereof or is manufactured using a design of a device, manufacturer, processor, packer, or distributor other than the person or persons who in fact manufacture, process, pack, or distribute such device and which thereby falsely purports or is represented to be the product of or who have been packed or distributed by such other device manufacturer, processor, packer, or distributor. The term cosmetic means articles intended to be rubbed, poured, sprinkled, or sprayed on, introduced into, or otherwise applied to the human body, or any part thereof for cleansing. Notice, this part is different from the other sections because it does not state man or other animals. It states specifically the human body. So if it was the body of a dog or the body of a rat or the body of a cow, it wouldn't apply under here. This section only specifically applies to the human body where all the others are, quote, man or other animals. Um, in continuation, promoting attractiveness or altering appearance. Notes that part right there. Altering appearance. Say you have a device at all whatsoever that alters appearance, well, that would be listed under cosmetic. So, uh, plastic max, because it could be introduced into, right? So th this uh, vague statement right there could apply to many things. And if you're ever looking for some sort of technology, some kind of cloaking technology, it will probably be listed under cosmetic for altering appearance. Anyway, and two articles intended for use as a component of such articles, except that such terms shall not include soap. The term official compendium means the official United States pharmacopoeia, official homeopathic pharmacopoeia of the United States, official national formulary, or any supplement to any of them. The term label means a display of written, printed, or graphic matter upon the immediate container of any article and a requirement made by or under authority of this chapter that any word, statement, or other information appear on the label shall not be considered to be complied with unless such word, statement, or other information also appears on the outside container or wrapper, if any there be, of the retail package of such article or is easily legible through the outside container or wrapper. The term immediate container does not include package liners. The term labeling means all labels and other written, printed, or graphic matter upon any article or any of its containers or wrappers and or accompanying such article. Now that, of course, is different to the, quote, wrappers of hip-hop music. Ha 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 ha. If an article alleged to be misbranded because labeling or advertising is misleading, then in determining whether labeling or advertising is misleading, there shall be taken into account, among other things, not only the representation made or suggested by statement, word, design, device, or any combination thereof, but also the extent to which the labeling or advertising fails to reveal facts material in the light of such representations or material with respect to consequences which may be result, which may result from the use of the article to which labeling or advertising relates under the conditions of use prescribed in labeling or advertising thereof, or under such condition, conditions of use as are customary or unusual usual. So that is a very complicated paragraph that is specifically written to state that you can make misleading labeling or advertising, essentially. So it comes from the statement that you can't mislead or make false advertising, essentially, unless, basically, that's what it's doing there. That's why it is so convoluted in that nonsense. The representation of a drug in its labeling as an antiseptic shall be considered to be a representation that it is a germicide. Notice that. If you put the label antiseptic on something, it shall be considered as a germicide. 
whether or not it is or not doesn't matter. It just means that if you have that label on there, then under this title, it will be considered as this other thing, of which it may not be. Anyway, except in the case of a drug purporting to be or represented as an antiseptic for inhibitory use as a wet dressing, ointment, dusting powder, or such other use as involves prolonged contact with the body. The term new drug means any drug, drug except a new animal drug or an animal feed bearing or containing a new animal drug. The composition of which is such that such drug is not generally recognized among experts qualified by scientific training and experience to evaluate the safety and effectiveness of drugs as safe and effective for use under the conditions prescribed, recommended, or suggested in the labeling thereof. Except that such a drug, not so recognized, shall be deemed to be a new drug, if at any time prior to June 25, 1938, it was subject to the Food Drugs Act of June 30, 1906, as amended, and if at such time its labeling contained the same representations concerning the conditions of its use. Now, there's a couple things in this article. First of all, this is the idea of the Constitution as a living document. You have all of these corporate edicts that are constantly being amended. Those are living documents. They are documents that continuously take new form. Because the people that wrote them are not creative. And most of the individuals that countermand these things will always come with, up with creative solutions. And hence, amendments are required to all those documents so that then they can counteract all the creative methods that people find to get around all of these fraudulent edicts. Also, in this title, it states that it states experts qualified by scientific training and experience to evaluate the safety and effectiveness of drugs. So it has to be an expert qualified. So the expert is qualified by training and experience, which has to be scientific, in the evaluation. So it's not somebody who is trained and has experience scientifically. They have to specifically be trained and have experience in the evaluation of the safety and effectiveness of drugs. So if they don't have experience and training in evaluation, then according to this title, they can't do what it's talking about. Anyway, any drug except a new animal drug or an animal feed bearing or containing a new animal drug, the composition of which is such that such drug, as a result of investigations to determine its safety and effectiveness for use under such conditions, has become so recognized, but which has not otherwise in such investigations been used to a material extent or for a material time under such conditions. Now, these two parts right here, uh, in addition to all the rest of this, the garbage is very important today for that substance which shall not be named because of so much unlawful and criminal censorship but i'm sure everybody knows what i'm talking about <laughs> moving on to a different and equally awful code we have 21 usc 21 21 edition of course Title 21, Food and Drugs, Chapter 9, Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, Subchapter 9, Tobacco Products, Section 387, Definition. 387 Definitions. In this subchapter, one, additive. The term additive means any substance, the intended use of which results or may reasonably be expected to result directly or indirectly in its becoming a component or otherwise affecting the characteristics of any tobacco product, including any substances intended for use as flavoring, or coloring, or in producing, manufacturing, packing, processing, preparing, treating, packaging, transporting, or holding, except that such term does not include tobacco or a pesticide chemical residue in or on raw tobacco or a pesticide chemical. So additive does not mean tobacco or pesticide chemical. If you have pesticide chemicals in tobacco, under this code, it is not an additive. Isn't that interesting? Why is there a specific distinction in this code stating that a pesticide chemical is not an ad additive to tobacco? Very odd. Except it's really not. <laughs> Next, commerce. 
The term commerce has the meaning given that term by section 1332-2 of Title 15. So there's another thing where you have to go look up what they're saying somewhere else. They don't just state it where it is, right? They could quote the definition from that, that section, but no. They want the person reading it. Of course, they don't want anyone reading this stuff, so that's why they put it like that. It's rather ridiculous. This is all just copy and paste. Basically, what you're doing here, or what they're doing here, the idea, is that when they put the reference to where to find it, you could take a artificial intelligence program, something like that, and it will identify the section to go to, and it will copy and paste from that section. There is no cognition happening. This is set up so that a drone, whether it be a robot or an individual who has been so beaten down in the system that they just go around and do things and they don't really think about what they're doing, well, they only go to that section, copy and paste it, and put it somewhere else. There's no cognitive reasoning going on here. And that's the reason why they don't bother stating what that title is referencing. Next, the term Indian country has the meaning given such term in section 1151 of title 18. Indian tribe, the term Indian tribe has the meaning given such term in section 5304E of Title 25. Now, isn't that annoying? You have to go to two distinct separate titles just to get the definitions for Indian tribe and Indian country. Quite amazing. And those titles aren't even in this title of this, the one that we're reading about tobacco products. State, territory. The term state and territory shall have the meanings given to such terms in section 321 of this title. So, you have a section that defines state and territory, and then you have a separate section that defines state and territory again according to a different section. That seems odd in the apparent redundancy of it. United States. The term United States means the 50 states of the United States of America. <coughs> <clears throat> and the District of Columbia, the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico, Guam, the Virgin Islands, American Samoa, Wake Island, Midway Islands, Kingman Reef, Johnston Atoll, the Northern Mariana Islands, and any other trust territory or possession of the United States. A trust is a juridic mechanism, vehicle, whatever you want to call it. Either way, it is essentially a thing that holds other things. So you can put land into a trust. Trust territory. Now we get that rather awful title, the real famous Entities Deemed Citizens of the United States. This is 46 USC, 2021 edition, of course. Title 46 Shipping. Subtitle 5, Merchant Marine, Part A, General. Chapter 505, Other General Provisions, Section 50, 501, Entities Deemed Citizens in the United States from the U.S. Government Publishing Office, dpo.gov. So, if you want to find out who are citizens of the United States, you first have to go to the shipping title. And then you have to go to the Merchant Marine. And then you have to go to the General section. There is, there are very few people anyway that would know to do that. Unless, of course, you read through the other titles and you find out that this one's particularly referenced and then it's just basically copy and paste from that point. In general, in this subtitle, a corporation partnership or association is deemed to be a citizen of the United States only if the controlling interest is owned by citizens of the United States. However, if the corporation partnership or association is operating a vessel in the coastwide trade, at least 75% of the interest must be owned by citizens of the United States. Now, here's the interesting part. There are a large number of these corporation partnerships and associations that are owned by other partnerships, corporations, and associations. And because they're owned by other partnerships, corporations, associations that are uh, registered in the United States, then that subsidiary is deemed to be a U.S. citizen, 
because it's owned by another U.S. citizen corporation, partnership, or association. But then when you get to the end of the shell corporations, you find out that, in fact, the ultimate parent of all those corporations is foreign. That means that all of those subsidiary corporations are U.S. citizens, but the foreign entity that controls them isn't. That is the real reason behind all of this convoluted nonsense is so that you can have all those crown corporations that were beaten in 1775 reestablish all their control again. And that's how they do it through shell corporations like they did originally. Hence, all of this stuff in the Constitution specifically barring that kind of activity and the reason why the U.S. as a corporation is simply inapplicable to the supreme law of the land, the U.S. Constitution. The two things are diametrically opposed, and anybody who recognizes these codes and their legitimacy is, in fact, violating the U.S. Constitution and therefore an enemy of it, which really is a difficult position for people that have sworn allegiance to the U.S. Constitution, but they are then forced through arms and threat of death to follow these uh, unlawful edicts. Anyway, additional requirements for corporations. In the subtitle, a corporation is deemed to be a citizen of the United States only if, in addition to satisfying, satisfying the requirements in subsection A, it is incorporated under the laws of the United States or state, its chief executive officer by whatever title and the chairman of its board of directors are citizens of the United States and no more of its directors are non-citizens than a minority of the number necessary to constitute a quorum. So all of these things are doing is they're pretending to try and block foreign control, while in fact what they're doing is they're opening the doors to foreign control. Determination of controlling corporate interest. The controlling interest in a corporation is owned by citizens of the United States under subsection A only if title to the majority of the stock in the corporation is vested in the citizens of the United States free from any trust or fiduciary obligation in favor of a person not a citizen of the United States. Now, obviously, that one is generally violated, and that's because the next sections allow for it. The majority of the voting power in the corporation is vested in citizens of the United States. There is no contract or understanding by which the majority of the voting power in the corporation may be exercised directly or indirectly on behalf of a person not a citizen of the United States. And there is no other, per other means by which control of the corporation is given to or permitted to be exercised by a person not a citizen of the United States. Again. You can have a corporation, which is owned by another corporation, and both of those corporations are headquartered in the United States, but then the ultimate parent of multiple levels is foreign, and they won't be violating this title because all the uh, sequential subsidiary corporations are all U.S. citizens. Determination of 75% corporate interest. At least 75% of the interest in a corporation is owned by citizens of the United States under subsection A only if title to at least 75% of the stock in the corporation is vested in citizens of the United States free from any trust or fiduciary obligation in favor of a person not a citizen of the United States. At least 75% of the voting power in the corporation is vested in citizens of the United States. There is no contract or understanding by which more than 25% of the voting power in the corporation may be exercised directly or indirectly on behalf of a person not a citizen of the United States. There is no other means by which control of more than 25% of any interest in the corporation is given to or permitted to be exercised by a person not a citizen of the United States. Fortunately, there is an executive order that sort of helps address this issue of the convoluted way in which unlawful and criminal uh, interests are enforced against people through the uh, threat of death uh, unlawfully under the color of law uh, against the Constitution. This is volume 86, number 13, from Friday, January 22nd, 2021. Executive Order 13980 of January 18, 2021. Protecting Americans from Overcriminalization Through Regulatory Reform. So, the title for this one is actually addressing regulatory reform that creates overcriminalization. But what it seems like it's doing is reforming the regulations 
to protect Americans from overcriminalization. Now, it could be doing both, but either way, both of those two ideas are separate. So it could mean both. Either way. By the authority vested me as president of, by the Constitution and the laws of the United States of America, and to improve transparency with respect to the consequences of violating certain regulations and to protect Americans from facing unwarranted criminal punishment for unintentional violations of regulations, it is hereby ordered as follows. Section 1. Purpose. In the interest of fairness, federal criminal law should be clearly written so that all Americans can understand what is prohibited and act accordingly. <laughs> yeah. All of those codes are far from clearly written. Some statutes have authorized executive branch agencies to promulgate thousands of regulations, creating a thicket of requirements that can be difficult to navigate. And many of these regulations are enforceable through criminal processes and penalties. The purpose of this order is to alleviate regulatory burdens on Americans by ensuring that they have notice of potential criminal liability for violations of regulations and by focusing criminal enforcement of regulatory offenses on the most culpable individuals. Now, of course, this is what this basically is stating in no uncertain terms is that somebody needs to be notified. That, of course, includes the people acting under the color of law, pretending to follow the law. They aren't, of course, but they have to be notified of that so that they understand that what they're doing is a crime. And then if they continue doing it, then they're acting so willfully. Section two, policy. Policy is the policy of the federal government that agencies promulgating regulations that may subject a violator, violator to criminal penalties should be explicit about what conduct is subject to criminal penalties and the mens rea standard applicable to those offenses. Strict liability offenses are generally disfavored, United States v. United States Gypsum Co. 438 U.S. 422-438-1978, where appropriate agencies should consider administrative or civil enforcement of strict liability regulatory offenses rather than criminal enforcement of such offenses and Criminal prosecution based on regulatory offenses is most appropriate for those persons who know what is prohibited or required by the regulation and choose not to comply, thereby causing or risking substantial public harm. That part right there, risking substantial public harm, that has to do with the particular section in the Constitution about domestic tranquility. The actions of a person should be towards keeping the peace avoiding conflict in the sense that domestic tranquility is preserved. If you have to engage in conflict, it has to be for that end. You know, so you basically just can't go around starting fights. That's sort of what bad guys do. Anyway, criminal prosecutions based on regulatory offenses should focus on matters where a putative or putative defendant had actual or constructive knowledge that conduct was prohibited. So that's like all of your rogue government agents, so-called agents being, of course, the corporate agent going around and doing whatever they want willy nilly and not following their even even their own corporate regulations, just acting like it is their privilege for you to be in their presence. And I have uh, real many examples of those particular words being told to me by these types of individuals that are supposed to be subject to various things which they don't follow. And so when they have constructive knowledge that co that conduct is prohibited, then there's no reason why they can't be properly and uh, lawfully punished for it. Anyway, definis definitions for the purpose of his order. Agency has the mean meaning given to executive agency in Section 105 of Title V, United States Code. Now, there's an annoying reference to somewhere else without giving the wording of that. But then this section right here is very useful. Mens rea means the state of mind that by law must be proven to convict a particular defendant of a particular crime. There are several such mental states in the law applied by federal courts. Two common mental states are knowingly and willfully. A defendant acts knowingly with respect to an element of the offense if he or she has knowledge of the essential facts comprising that element. In addition, a defendant willfully violates a statute if he or she acts with bad purpose, 
that is with the knowledge that his or her conduct is unlawful. Or another word for that, of course, is bad faith, such as when somebody enters into a contract in bad faith, intending from the get-go not to fulfill what they are promising. Kind of like all of these corporate edicts are all done in bad faith, right? They're always a means to an end. They always start from one section and continue further on. That's all bad faith or bad purpose. Anyway, model criminal jury instructions, Third Circuit, 2018, Chapter 5, Section 5.02, CMT, quotation marks, omitted. By contrast, strict liability offenses do not require the government to prove mens rea. For instance, the jury instructions for the United States Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit note that some federal crimes are also strict or absolute liability offenses without any mental state requirement. ID at CH5, General Introduction to Mental State Instructions. So there's a direct contradiction to that thing that is constantly referred, uh, which is that uh, ignorance of the law is no excuse. Or, as some people say, especially in movies and is repeated in TV shows, is that ignorance of the law is no defense. The fact is that if you're going to punish somebody criminally, you have to establish that they knew what they were doing and it was willful. But once you do, and that individual continues with it, well, that's that, right? Person has the meaning given to it in Section 1 of Title 1, United States Code. Regulatory offense means any violation of a regulation promulgated by an agency. Promoting regulatory transparency, all notices of proposed rulemaking and PRMs, and final rules published in the Federal Register after issuance of this order should include a statement that describes whether individuals who violate any of the prohibitions or fail to comply with any requirements imposed by the regulation or rule may be subject to any or may be subject to criminal penalties. Agencies should draft this statement in consultation with the Department of Justice. For purposes of this order, a regulation is treated as subjecting individuals to criminal penalties when violation of the regulation is itself a basis for criminal liability under federal law. So there's some interesting wording there, which uh, isn't exactly clear about what it's saying. The regulatory text of all NPRMs and final rules with criminal consequences published in the Federal Register after issuance of this order should consistent with applicable law. Now notice that thing that you don't ever see in any of the codes is that term applicable law. There are many laws that are applicable, but all of them are subject to the supreme law of the land. So if you do applicable law, it's like a catch all. It's sort of recognizing the constitution, but then anything else that might also uh, be a, a, of applicability. Explicitly state a mens rea requirement for each such provision or identify the provision as a strict liability offense accompanied by citations to the relevant provisions of the authorizing statute. Prior to publishing the Federal Register an NPRM or final rule that contains a regulatory offense not specifically articulated in the authorizing statute and may subject a violator to potential criminal liability with no mens rea requirement, for a regulatory offense that includes an element that does not require proof of mens rea, including jurisdictional and venue elements, the applicable agency should submit a brief justification for use of a strict liability standard, as well as the source of legal authority for the imposition of such a standard to the administrator of the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs in the Office of Management and Budget Administrator. Now that kind of sounds like the part in the U.S. Constitution that talks about no warrants shall issue, and in that case, as in all cases, of what it's supposed to be, a legitimate constitutional warrant is a sealed document which is delivered from the writer to the recipient without breach of the seal. We don't have that. What we have are these corporate orders and mandates with the title warrant on them, but they're not actually a warrant. 
So this is sort of talking about that idea is that if you are going to issue a warrant, it has to be under oath of or affirmation, specifically stating the place and blah, blah, blah. So it's kind of in that same idea, but it's not really the same thing. In response to these agencies submissions, the administrator shall provide implementation guidance to agencies on this order, monitor agency regulatory actions pursuant to this order, and advise agencies if their actions are inconsistent with the principles set forth in this order and or otherwise conflict with the policies or actions of another agency. After such consultation, a statement of justification should be published in the Federal Register with the NPRM and the final rule. Agency referrals for potential criminal enforcement. Within 45 days of the date of this order and in consultation with the Department of Justice, each agency should publish guidance in the Federal Register describing its plan to administratively address regulatory offenses subject to potential criminal liability, rather than refer those offenses to the Department of Justice for criminal enforcement. Such guidance should make clear that when agencies are enforcing regulations related to a statutory criminal violations subject to strict liability and deciding whether to refer the matter to the Department of Justice, agencies should consider factors such as the harm or risk of harm, pecuniary or otherwise caused by the alleged offense, the potential gain to the putative defendant that could result from the offense, whether the putative defendant held specialized knowledge, expertise, or was licensed in an industry related to the rule or regulation at issue, and evidence, if any is available, of the putative defendant's knowledge or lack thereof of the regulation at issue. Notwithstanding these considerations, I really don't like when people use that word, notwithstanding. Often they don't understand how it's being used, and in this context it seems like that's the case, because something that has no standing does not require reference. If it has no standing, then there's no reason to write about it, because it's got no standing. That's what notwithstanding means, no standing. Anyway... The guidance should not deter, limit, or delay agency referrals to the Department of Justice where either the putative defendant's state of mind is unknown because further investigation is required or there exists a reasonable indication that a crime has been committed based on the evidence available. When required by internal agency policies or practice, an agency may refer alleged regulatory offenses carrying potential criminal consequences to its designated investigation law enforcement offices for investigation of the viability of the charge subject to the guidance described in 5A of this order governing referral of regulatory offenses subject to strict liability. General provisions A. Nothing in this order shall be construed to impair or otherwise affect the authority granted by law to an executive department or agency or the head thereof or the functions of the director of the Office of Management and Budget relating to budgetary, administrative, or legislative proposals. This order shall be implemented consistent with applicable law and subject to the availability of appropriations. Notwithstanding any other provisions in this order, nothing in this order shall apply to any action that pertains to foreign or military affairs or to a national security or homeland security function of the United States, other than procurement actions and actions involving the import or export of non-defense articles and services. To any action that the Department of Justice takes related to a criminal investigation or prosecution, including undercover operations or any civil enforcement related to action or related investigation by the Department of Justice in addition to any action related to a civil investigation demand under 18 U.S.C. 1958. To any action related to counterfeit goods, pirated goods, or other goods that infringe intellectual property rights or goods that are adulterated or misbranded or goods which regulatory approval was required prior to distribution but not obtained. Now this part right here is referencing that thing that we looked at before talking about very uh, convoluted, in a convoluted manner, the labeling of products, especially drugs. To strict liability misdemeanor prosecutions concluded via plea agreement to any investigation or misconduct by an agency employee or any disciplinary corrective or employment action taken against any agency employee or in any other circumstance or proceeding to which application of this order or any part of this order would, in the judgment of the head of the agency, undermine the national security. This order is not intended to and does not create any right or benefit, substantive or, sub substantive or procedural, 
enforceable at law or in equity by any party against the United States, its department agencies or entities, its officers, employees, or agents, or any other person. That signed the White House January 18, 2021. So if you have enjoyed this video, please like it, share it, subscribe to my channels, check out my other content. There are free books available at the link. And if you so desire, you may support my work at PayPal or Cash App.